When you conquer a planet as almost completely as we have as a species, you tend to feel relatively safe from the dangers that this rock possesses. Inside your homes, your towns, your cities, it's fairly unusual for something to come along and completely destroy everything you thought you knew. And with that, a form of the destruction may actually already be known to you or like a known problem, so it's not like, oh, who could have seen this coming? Throughout human history, warring factions may show up here and there, a concussive force detonator may get dropped on a population, or even your own people may turn on one another. But the connecting line here is that it all has to do with humanity and its actions. The concept of something happening so far out of our control, with even a combined effort of humanity attempting to stop it, is such a horrific concept because we rarely have to deal with such calamities. Natural disasters, illness, and threats from space such as asteroids, which we really haven't had to contend with as of yet, are things that despite our best efforts, we have had issues with the past and we will have issues controlling them in the future. One such issue, depending on who you ask, originates initially outside of human control, and there is a reason for that. This disease would be imposed upon humanity which would result in the destruction of our species in large swaths, but strangely, some were rendered immune. So in today's episode, let's discuss where the THV or tacky transmissive Haran virus originates from, how it was propelled to new heights by human intervention, and how the human body may attempt to contend with the virus depending on the age of the individual. So let's start our story where all good stories start, at the beginning, unless it's the 1970s and for some reason uh, we're starting at the end of Star Wars as opposed to the beginning, and for this we have to go back to the beginning. We have to go all the way back to Haran. This will be kind of a quick run through because we are really focusing on the dying light 2 form of the disease, but in the beginning, man kept effing around and finding out, which is rather typical for our species. And just as a heads up, things are about to get out there, I promise you. Uh, it was actually a part of the lore, which actually sets the tone for why this is all happening. A man by the name of Mr. Barris Baruch, who was working in the Old Town District of Haran, would have a violent outburst out of nowhere. He would go on to attack eight people and end the existence of two of them. After this outburst, it became apparent that nobody was really infected by his attack, but it was alarming to see what could happen in the wake of this infection. The GRE scientists would come to the ultimate conclusion at this point that it could not have been air or waterborne, seeing as nobody else was infected. So they concluded a food source may have carried the virus into Haran. Initially, it was regarded as just the flu virus that had mutated, which happens every year, but this time it would cause violence, although most people were not in the know about this, so they had no idea the violent attacks on the rise were actually a part of the sickness. Now, initially, this shows that the Haran virus would most definitely be inducing neurological damage on a wide scale to the nerve of the body, known as the central nervous system, or in particular, the brain specifically, would likely see decreased activity in the frontal lobe where emotional control is located, and would likely see more activity in the amygdala due to inflammation of the meninges, known as meningitis. All over the brain, downward pressure would be put on the brain by the meninges swelling and potentially even an encephalotic event, which I'm not 100% sure if encephalotic is actually a word. It seems like it's the past tense of encephalitis in my head, but uh, this would lead to violent behavioral changes, seizures, and blurred vision potentially put forth by injuring the occipital lobe, being the visual processing center of the brain. As the Haran virus spread through the city, eventually a counter was created to this disease. Antizen would be the first to be used to stop the symptoms from progressing, but this was considered a band-aid to the problem. They really needed a vaccine. Scientists would come together and understand the implications that if this disease escaped, it would immediately kind of destroy the world. See, the beauty of a vaccine is though, if your body knows what it's dealing with, it can go thermonuclear on it as soon as the virus shows up and destroy it before it even has a chance to establish a foothold. Because remember, your immune system when primed can quite literally fight anything. Your immune system operates with more than just uh, show up and conduct phagocytosis. Uh, if you are like completely unaware, your immune system operates on literal physics. Every day your body creates B cells capable of producing antibodies to a disease that doesn't even exist yet, just on the off chance it may someday run across something from like Mars that it's never seen before. The immune system is quite amazing. But anyhow, this vaccine would prove extremely effective in the fight against the Haran virus, but still, people had no idea where it came from which is why the GRE may have been so interested in unlocking its origins in the first place. Prior to Haran virus being cured, the GRE would begin making money moves, collecting samples and experimenting on this disease. It may have seemed like a fairly stupid idea and stupid thing to do, but it's important to remember that as we sit here in real life, this is happening everywhere. Any country that is capable of doing so will do so, and you would be highly disturbed to know just how many crises are averted almost daily. Dread aside, because that's not what we're here for, the reason the GRE was so interested is because of what they found in the original Dying Light. As you survive Haran, crashed in a lake, it's possible that you could find the origin of this disease, or at least a clue 
discussing the origin. Initially, it was regarded as the flu because they had no idea what else to call it, and it really just popped up out of nowhere. But really, it's closer to everyone's favorite and most horrifying disease apart from prions, rabies. You can think of it almost like the common cold in terms of onset and transmissibility, but with rabies. This neurological virus basically has had very few people survive in terms of natural immunity. I think probably about five people total. Once the symptoms set in, it is too late to help the person, and they will meet their end unless you utilize a pretty much new method known as the Milwaukee Protocol, which involves a medically induced coma, lowering their core temperature and giving them extremely strong antiviral medication, along with vaccinating them, if I remember correctly. This raises your chances of surviving from essentially a negligible 0.0001% to an 18%. Remember, if you are bit by anything, run, don't walk to the emergency room. Better to get those shots and survive with a 100% cure rate than, you know, have a wait and see attitude. Anyhow, back on track. Down in the waters, you can find exactly what may have led to this outbreak. There is a literal ship down there. Now, it suggests that this is an Easter egg for fun, but I doubt it. When looking for how a disease has started or what may have happened, the first place you should look for are outliers. How did the environment change? Was there a natural disaster that dredged up flesh-eating bacteria from the swamps? Did an ice melt release a megavirus from a million years ago into the modern era? Did a cat sneeze into someone's open mouth? You know, things like that. An alien ship being found in the waters of Haran is definitely an event that would have kicked off this entire problem. Plus, the disease profile would indicate that something had to be different about specifically the Haran virus, but similar enough to Earth's pathogens to create this problem. Whether this alien was infected with a form of pathogen similar to the rabies virus on Earth and then contaminated the environment, or perhaps it was something as simple as, you know, this could have been like a cold to the alien and then it was released in the environment, all of this is unknown. But it's also suggested that these aliens are known as the Gatoids. I know, we're really kind of getting out there. And it says that they've been on Earth for quite some time and that they founded the Illuminati. What? I don't know how true that is, but it's interesting that that's in the lore. So to me, this looks like an accidental exposure event that just landed in an environment that it was highly fit in. You can think of this sort of like the lionfish in the Caribbean as a massive nuisance that's also beating out other species for, you know, food, space, and basically life. In the Indo-Pacific area where they originated from, they are kept in check by predators in those waters and serve as a wonderful food source. But in the Caribbean, there are no natural predators to really keep these fish in check. So in one environment, they do not grow out of control, given other animals are involved and then they eat them. But in another environment, there are no natural predators. Diseases are very similar. In one environment, it may be that the disease has issues contending with a honed immune system. In another environment, the disease absolutely wrecks anything and everyone because it just so happens to be highly fit for that particular area. The Haran virus is likely following the same pattern. But this would very likely catch the attention of the GRE, and when studying the virus, it's highly likely they notice some non-Earth traits about it. While they may not have found the ship, this would pique their interest to continuing the work in secrecy and maybe prove there could be other forms of life out there. Of course, it depends on which scientist you ask concerning if a virus is alive or not. Also, don't worry, we are getting to Dying Light 2 here in a moment, just, just bear with me. But as always, when I set in on a new game, we need to establish what's going on as a basis. As the GRE continued working, this would ultimately result in a a worse version of the Haran virus. Gee, imagine that. You took something that was, I guess, relatively natural, but I mean, maybe not too natural to this environment, and then you made it into something worse. Nice going. I'm sure this won't result in a bunch of stupid stuff going down all over the planet. And stupid stuff going down all over the planet, it indeed did. Known as the fall, humanity would be absolutely crippled by this new virus. Known as tacky transmissive Haran virus, or tacky meaning fast or rapid, and transmissive meaning transmissive, and Emia, meaning presence in the blood. Shout out to my favorite medical YouTuber, Chubby Emu, for making me terrified of gas station sushi. Gotta be my favorite forms of hypochondriasis, or hypochondriasis, it just really doesn't matter. Also known now as illness anxiety disorder. Anyways, this virus would cause a massive issue for Homo sapiens because we took something bad and made it worse in the 2020s. Oops. Classic humanity, never change. The virus was now more deadly and orders of magnitude more infectious. This virus would escape the facilities that they were being tested on, where we go on to wipe out 98% of the human population on the spot. So in July of 2020, there were about 7,840,952,880 people, give or take a few million. Presumably around this time is when the virus dropped. 
It would clearly take some time for it to spread, but by the following year, 98% of humanity had flatlined. They didn't turn into monsters, they didn't like have their resistance, they were just gone. That was 7,684,131,862 people who just dropped due to this new virus. They said at the beginning, 45,000 people a day were dropping. And then by the end of it, it was like 365,000 people a day were dropping. So this was known affectionately as the fall because it really was. This only left 156,821,017 people up and walking, but the issue was many of those were turned and infected. The numbers are unclear, but as this virus spread, the United States government would fall quickly as the nation became a wasteland of infected. Japan was said to be absolutely decimated by the infection along with all of Asia, so it's safe to assume there were maybe some pockets of humanity left, but not many. Europe would somehow hang on, which I find the most hilarious because the US has the absolute means to take down a threat on a civilian level, but did we have the cardio to outrun them? Maybe not so much. As Europe began to succumb to the virus because nothing was safe, just like every other nation prior, governments and order would break down. Borders would be closed and eventually the nation would still be overrun because the infected don't really care about closing borders. This ultimately would lead to city after city to be destroyed. Small towns were next, and eventually even my house would be overrun, and probably yours too. This led to sporadic, disjointed, and disconnected enclaves of humans to band together to try to survive. But with that many infected out there, especially that early in the game, survival was far but assured. Given that those infected show a predisposition for violence and are easily able to transmit the virus, this would continue taking out those who were bitten. This would still have the same rate of infection. 98% would just drop. The other 2% of infection cases would be up and walking. Of course, non-infected were factored into that initial 2% figure because they didn't drop. It's really hard to know what ratio were infected to non-infected in the remaining 2% of the population, but when you run around any place that has infections, it's like for every one human you see, you see 50 infected. So anyhow, number games aside, the point is humanity was on the brink of likely not having enough genetic diversity in order to restart. But what's more interesting is, leading credence to the alien overlord theory, is that there were those immune to the virus, and those are going to be younglings. The younglings can obviously still be eaten by the infected just like anyone else can, and undoubtedly many have, but don't you find it a little odd that they are the ones who can survive this disease and are outright immune? Let's discuss that for a moment. One of the important things to know is there is a massive difference between adults and offspring to a certain age. And this is why things like pediatrics exist, because the medication you can give to an adult is not the same medication that you can give to a pre-adult. And it's not just the size of a person, but their literal biochemistry. Pre-adults in terms of enzymes, responses to illness, and in general how they react to medications it's gonna be completely different compared to an adult. Based on this, I see two possibilities. One sheds light on if there is a conspiracy to take over the human race, and the other sheds light on how they actually overcome tacky transmissive Huron virus. When a person is infected in real life, like right now, depending on their age is how their bodies will respond. It has been noted that in adults, for instance, at the point that they are infected, they will produce antibodies with these levels spiking quickly and then lasting for a few weeks as they decline. Now you're gonna have low levels of antibodies still present, but it's going to be a lot less. And this is because typically the body has been there and done that, and once the virus is brought under control, so too is the immune response. Pre-adults have a completely different response. They will have their antibodies spike, and for an observable 300 day period afterwards, it will remain as high. Now the question is, why? First, this is clearly an advantageous trait, which is why it's been passed down. Pre-adults are, let's be clear, kind of gross. There's no way around it. Licking their hands and touching one another's face, wet coughs without covering their mouths, eating boogers, all the greatest hits. And we can't judge them because we too were once young and probably did the same thing. Uh, you've just chose to block it out. That's right, bro. Everybody knows you used to eat your boogers. <laughs> Conversely, adults try to be less gross. We wash our hands, hopefully, and avoid sickness and sick people. And in general, we try to isolate when sick in the interest of others and because we just feel absolutely crappy. Because of this experience and knowledge, we limit disease outbreak. And I know some people in the comments are going to scoff at that. And, you know, obviously recent times have shown some people really don't care. People have always not cared, but exceptions don't mean there's no rule. Most people will not intend on getting others sick and will behave in line with what makes them feel better and is pro-social. That's what humans do. We are social creatures. Offspring do not have this ability to think forward. Therefore, in an environment filled with those non-thinking forward people or really thinking about others, because they are young, it's just how it is. It would be imperative for their bodies to stay on high alert and keep antibodies high in their system for longer 
as clearly the offspring is going to be exposed probably after just a few weeks again to the same virus. In this way, we can make out why the offspring may be immune to THV. With higher levels of antibodies that last longer, the THV may just have an issue of gaining a foothold in the offspring. And with an altered immune response, it might actually be calmer. Now it should be known that the Huron virus would actually infect offspring, meaning something has fundamentally changed concerning THV, which would help to explain the takeover of humanity. Now let me ask you a question. Do you know how to destroy and mold the minds of a species? It's as simple as getting rid of the adults. Adults have experience, and the older those adults get, the more experience they should have. They have knowledge of the land, they have information and wisdom that can be used to guide younger populations to a better line of thinking. And if you make an environment where the oldest individual is just entering puberty, what wisdom do they have to pass on? What would they know apart from just pure survival that they could show others? And if the environment is still saturated with THV, then it's highly likely when they entered adulthood, they would just run into the same issues with infection. This limits who's immune and naive against who's able to be infected but may have wisdom. This would impact the human race for generations to come, leading to a complete breakdown of society and loss of knowledge to who we once were. Any species caught in this event would become weaker overall and subject to another species perhaps bending of their will and perception of the world around them. Basically, the younger you are, the more susceptible to brainwashing you are, whether you think it or not. It's just the reality, which is why uh, in my advanced age now, I look at people probably about 10 years younger than me and ask myself, what in the name of all that is holy are you doing? But that's neither here nor there. The point is, the younger you are, the more susceptible you are to suggestions and the less likely you are to think for yourself until your frontal lobe completely stops developing, mostly, well, stops mostly developing at around 25, although it's still said to undergo changes until you're about 40. This would be the perfect way to take a planet and create, in turn, a species that is subservient while also thinning their numbers entirely. Now, again, the, the second way is, is potentially when the GRE made this new form of virus, for some reason it was not able to contend with high levels of antibodies just in general. So there was the explosive phase where offspring would get sick, but then as the antibodies stayed high for such a long period of time, this actually kept the virus in check, whereas with adults, the amount of antibodies just plummeted, leading to their subsequent turning into these infected. But the question from here is not so much why potentially the alien species would drop this virus on humanity, but how it actually works and what the human body would do to attempt to combat it. Although to be honest, it's like putting Stephen Hawking in a ring with Mike Tyson, our immune systems just could not contend with this infection. So first and foremost, it's important to understand that much like rabies, THV spreads in much the same way. Any bodily fluids that are made by your body appear to be able to transmit this, which will lead to an infection of a person. Now typically, this is gonna be something like saliva to the bloodstream if you're bit, but you may have unknowingly hooked up with someone who was infected prior to them turning, and there's really no reason to think that you couldn't have an exposure event through that as well and be infected. So remember, all it takes is for the virus to enter a mucosal membrane, and that's pretty much game over at that point. But seeing that it's comparable to rabies and appears to induce many of the same symptoms, we can assume a few things about it. First, this is a neurological disease as shown with those infected and their behavioral patterns. When infected, however, unlike rabies, it's more than likely it wouldn't take the peripheral nervous system towards the spine given how quickly it's able to induce symptoms in a person. Instead, it appears to me that this is a blood-based disease that is then able to bypass the blood-brain barrier itself, enter the nervous system directly, which at this point it would begin infecting neurons to pump out more of the virus, and this would lead to a rapid decompensation event. Prior to this, however, your immune system would become quickly aware, uh-oh, we're invaded by a virus. Encountering it in the bloodstream, your macrophages would quickly try to clean up the invader, but they would be overwhelmed, which is actually pretty standard for your innate immune system. Essentially, your innate immune system is there to buy time for your adaptive immune system to kick in. Your dendritic cells would bring back pieces of THV to the B cells looking for any B cell that recognized it. Very likely, it would find a B cell that could create antibodies to the virus. But therein lies the issue. The adaptive immune system takes days to respond. The B cells have to undergo proliferation in order to release antibodies. So in the meantime, the body would begin experiencing symptoms like any other infection. Stage one results in flu-like symptoms such as coughing, congestion, profuse sweating, fever, and body aches and chills, and this would be an indicator that it is all over the body and that your immune system is attempting to fight THV. However, one indicator 
which show that the virus has already made it into the brain at this point, which is a really big problem, and those are going to be dilated pupils. This would be the most concerning outcome because this delineates it from most infections. Medical professionals look for pupil response in terms of constriction to confirm if there's issues with the brain. If your pupils are just dilated out, this is already indicating that really, really quickly this virus is already present in the brain to a degree and it is beginning to disrupt function. As the body continues to panic because the central nervous system is infected, this would result in meningitis as mentioned previously, which begins putting pressure on the brain, potentially leading to those dilated pupils. This can also lead to like a stiff neck, behavioral changes such as aggression, crying, or in general emotional outbursts. And along with this, infections of the brain send your body into a panic as encephalitis and inflammation in the brain itself would begin to mount up with a cytokine storm on the horizon as the body goes completely all out to try to save itself. Although cytokine storms, really, really bad. They just cause a lot of damage. Uh, <laughs> you got to kind of wonder why we have those. I mean, at some point it must have been effective, but it's like, that's basically your brain pushing the button saying, well, we've tried everything else. We're just going to nuke ourselves. Hopefully that'll get rid of the virus. Fantastic. So as the body loses ground minute by minute, stage one will turn into stage two. As the brain is affected, the temperature of the body would be affected as well. The hypothalamus would be put under immense pressures and the rest of the brain is also experiencing this. And this would lead to dysregulation of multiple systems. Fever would begin spiking to dangerous levels. Breathing would become very, very rapid and shallow to basically deal with the fact that the body is undergoing probably a metabolic increase because of what we're about to talk about. The fever is said to spike to levels as high as 43 degrees Celsius or 109 degrees Fahrenheit. It's important to understand why this is bad. First, brain damage begins to occur at around 107.6 degrees Fahrenheit or around 42 degrees Celsius. One time when I was sick as a youngling, I had a temperature go up to 105.9 and I was legitimately starting to hallucinate. At 109 degrees, this delirium will run deep in a person, but what I find interesting is it's not just brain damage at 109 degrees that you have to contend with, but human cells in general are only viable up to 106 degrees. After that, denaturing of proteins can happen, leading to cellular death in your body. And obviously, necrosis is never good and this causes infections and this could lead to your end. But this would seem to indicate that THV may in some way bolster cells to survive at these higher temperatures. Although it's pretty apparent how, you know, decimated the infected look. The, most of these cells were really not offer this protection at higher temperatures, but they still have enough viable cells to move. Stage three highlights this severe issue. While some cells in the body can continue to contend with issues possibly through things like gene manipulation brought on by the virus, because it's important to remember the Huron virus would attack nucleobases of DNA, it may be adding its genetic coding, forcing the cell to potentially create more stable proteins and enzymes at higher temperatures, and that would be beneficial for the cell. It's also important to note that all cells were not infected, and I'll just rounding back, it's beneficial for the cell because the cell survives. What's beneficial for the cell may not be beneficial for you. It's like my Last of Us um, episodes when I said the fungus is actually supporting the cells, so it is somewhat of a symbiotic relationship. People are like, no, it's parasitic. It's like, no, it's, it's not parasitic. It's using the cell, but the cell is also using the, I guess, nutrients that the fungus is putting off. So it, it is somewhat symbiotic. It's just not symbiotic for your consciousness. But these cells that weren't exposed in time to the virus and then changed would fall away and be destroyed by the internal core temperature. And this leads to a massive amount of degradation because the tissue is just going to fall away because it's essentially been turned into nothing. The same process is very clearly taking place in the brain as they will have muscle spasms, seizures, and lose their ability to speak. Although some virals have been shown, which virals are just at the beginning of the infection stage, they've been shown to stop themselves and talk before being taken out by non-infected or those who have their infection under control. This shows that while it's a moment of clarity and they are still in there somewhat, they have reached a point where the infection has overwhelmed their brain and the temperature rise has made it impossible for them to control themselves, which is rather unfortunate. So as the degradation continues through, this will become less and less of an issue and they will start thinking less and less. Stage four is known as the turning point. There is no going back. Again, THV definitely does insert genes into the human genome, and as a result, the functionality and ability of the cell to contend with higher temperatures changes. The person's brain has become so damaged, they're running on pure instinct at this point. And much like with rabies, their aggression levels need to eat like any other animals, it might even be at a higher rate given that their metabolisms would be working triple overtime to support their internal temperature like that. This all means that they will go after anything that's close to them aggressively and without any thought as to who the person was. Mainly because with that many areas of the brain destroyed, memories are no longer going to hold any weight as they are just completely gone. Because once you disrupt the actual connections in the brain, those pieces, like, 
it's destroyed. Like memories are gone. They're destroyed. The patterning is no longer there. But the human side of them is also going to be destroyed. So we can assume the cerebrum is mostly in tatters. Now they are just like any other animal with corrupted instincts. They need to eat and they are directed by the virus. Because remember, rabies wants to spread just like any other virus. They want to spread. It's not just by accident. Now, what does that say about consciousness? <laughs> It's really hard to say actually, but rabies ends up in spit for a reason. And this is because it was beneficial. How would a virus know to do something that is beneficial? And to that question, I ask, how would a tree know to make a flower look like a bird so insects don't come near it? How would a tree know what a bird looks like? It's the same thing in pattern that's seen all throughout life. It seems like something shouldn't be able to observe something else, yet it's able to mimic. It, it's absolutely wild. But perhaps I am personifying it a little too much, but that's what's always fascinated me about viruses. How they change to become better at spreading. Regardless of that philosophical thought, stage four is the end, leading to one of two paths. Either they will be successful in their hunts and continue to change and become more and more fit to their environment, indicating that the longer the virus is in their body, the more beneficial gene mutations will happen, which then leads to things like volatiles, or they will not be as successful seeing as most are already infected around them, and this will lead them to become biters, which I have an episode over the biters if you'd like to see it from originally Dying Light 1, and I also have an episode discussing the Haran virus more in depth as well, but this one is supposed to be more focused on Dying Light 2's tacky transmissive Haran virus. Ultimately, if you ask me, I think this virus does not originate from Earth. Given the context clues and how rapidly it spread, this is unlike anything apart from maybe measles, where it is said if 10 people stand around somebody who's infected, nine of them will contract it. But given the GRE was hellbent on making it worse, it would almost indicate that perhaps a manipulation of work, almost comparable to that of the marker in Dead Space, it wanted scientists to recreate it so it could trigger a necromorph outbreak. GRE scientists may have been manipulated by higher ups who may or may not have been human by the sound of it to create a better version of something to overcome the failures of the original plan because Homo sapiens turned out to be a little more intelligent than they originally thought. But in Dying Light 2, the jig is up, the news is out, humanity is boned. But anyhow, I want to hear what you guys think. I'm not saying it was aliens, but it's aliens. Or do you think I'm just a crackhead and this is a naturally occurring disease? Let me know down in the comments. If you would like to leave a comment, actually, or possibly even a like for the algorithm, that would be awesome of you as it's January. And I don't know a content creator out there right now who hasn't had their analytics absolutely crashed into the dirt. It just happens. Great times. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and Roanoke Tales channel link where I'm also streaming again. Should be doing that like twice a week on Roanoke Gaming and my Twitch account, Roanoke Games. But speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank my Roanoke. Real quick. First, huge thank you to our astrophysicist, Death's Dancer. Thank you, man. I'd also like to thank our scientist, Chad, the enjoyer of explanations of B grade horror movies, Dakota23, Florian, Lucian Dragon, The Last Final Girl on the Left, and Trash Panda in a Trench Coat. Thank you, guys. And the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping this channel running, and it's greatly appreciated. All right, so that's going to do for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see y'all in the next one.